first of all, thanks to Kelly and Jim for the invitation to be here and for this fantastic event. I think this is a great kickoff to a very important thing in our country. Um, as Jim just indicated, I was asked to uh, talk to you this morning wearing a few different hats. Uh, the Canadian Academy of Health Science hat to tell you about this project we did on ROI of health research. But I'm also a clinician and a researcher and I'm trying to run a little organization in Alberta to try and drive health services reform by redesigning the health system. So just uh, my comments will reflect all of those various roles. Uh, and given uh, the setup of this room, I'm going to only refer to a few slides in this presentation uh, and I'll try and highlight those as I go along. Um, I think the executive summary of what I'm going to say to you is that I think the current barriers that we have in this country um, relate to the lack of def definitions of value, the lack of measurement of value, and the lack of engagement of the right people in that discussion to drive value, um, both in the research world and clinical world, I would say. And uh, I have to say I believe that physicians are a key stakeholder group that need to be engaged better in this discussion, uh, as I think they're the ones that are driving a lot of decisions that are driving cost and are driving the overall value or lack thereof of our system. So the rhetorical question I guess I put on the title of this presentation was, you know, do you think we're getting value for money right now? And I think we're getting some value for money both in research world and in clinical world, but obviously we all believe we can do better. Uh, and I think that the first step of doing better, I believe, means, uh, as Dr. Evans just said, is being clear what we mean by value, putting a stake in the ground around that, what are we looking for exactly, commercialization of discovery, um, improvement in our healthcare system with improved health of our population, and are we measuring those things? So um, that was the challenge that uh, was put before me wearing my hat at the Canadian Academy of Health Science of uh, why would you want to measure uh, return on investment in health research right now. So we spent uh, 18 months with an international panel uh, writing a report that uh, is available to all of you on the Canadian Academy of Health Science website. Um, the full report, all of the references, everything that I'm about to say in this portion of the presentation is on that website. Uh, with a lot more explanation than I could uh, give it to uh, do here in a few minutes. So I would encourage you to look at that. Um, I would say that uh, the, the panel that we had were the world's experts at measuring ROI of health research. Uh, it was a pleasure to work with them. Um, as I mentioned, we spent 18 months uh, debating the best methods and metrics of how to capture ROI. Uh, we did an extensive uh, review of the literature. And we interviewed stakeholders from all different associations and the sponsors of this uh, project. We reviewed the literature extensively. And uh, not surprisingly, we found some serious problems in the literature with uh, attribution and contribution and uh, halo effects and uh, studying only positive outcomes of research are all kind of intrinsic problems in the literature in this area. Um, so our challenge was to define those issues and make some recommendations of how they need to be sorted out, which we did. And uh, I'm not gonna go through all the panel recommendations for you. Uh, I am gonna just focus on a couple of key things here. There is a logic to how research flows from a laboratory into use. Um, and it, um, produ it produce new knowledge that adds to the world reservoir of knowledge that is then uh, picked by users for their particular purposes depending on who they are. Um, one of the panelists named Martin Buxton is a co-author of a 
model called the payback model of health research that you should become familiar with. Um, and he helped inform our discussion about how research actually does flow downstream. The innovation of our panel was to define the target audiences that use research, that include people in the health industry, people in other industries, the public, uh, the government, and uh, other organizations with an interest in health that uh, uh, up, take up this knowledge and translate it for their particular use uh, that then has an impact on the health system and on the social determinants of health that lead to what we would call outcomes. Um, in retrospect, this uh, is not rocket science to map how knowledge flows, but it is important to try and measure in detail the interfaces between the production and use of knowledge at the output stage and then the uh, outcome stage. So the, uh, the detail, the devil is in the details as with any of these things. Uh, there are feedback loops, of course, in how knowledge is taken up and how it affects other knowledge being produced. Um, all of which contributes to capacity of research in our country. Um, you need to have some definitions of impact, which the, uh, uh, the panel reiterated that there are five big categories of research impact. They couldn't think of any other better definitions of impact than the five that are highlighted in red to the right side of that slide for you. Um, and the uh, the panel then uh, attributed those areas of impact to the logic framework. So you could look for those areas of impact in different user groups downstream from knowledge production. In other words, there is a logic, there is a way to measure, there are metrics and indicators around each of those five impact categories where you could actually, if you wanted to, measure the flow of knowledge. Um, there were some indicator and metric experts on the panel that um, helped us define what makes a good indicator or metric and there are some classifications of good indicators and metrics that people can use. Um, and we were then asked to create a library of the best indicators. So we started with about 350 and narrowed them down to the top 66 indicators and metrics that fit those criteria that I just mentioned to you, and they're all in that report. Uh, these you would consider the validated indicators. Um, now I was going to tell you more about how to use the framework and logic model and run you through an example of it, but I'm thinking that given uh, the time frame and the audience, that would be unnecessary. So I'm going to skip ahead to the second part of what I wanted to say to you this morning provoked by Jim at the uh, reception last night, I uh, wanted to talk to you more about wearing my clinician hat and uh, talk to you about the health system. As uh, Dr. Leach mentioned last night, um, I think that our health system uh, could be a lot better organized and uh, we're left to fend for ourselves out in the front lines more than we should be making business decisions that uh, should have been organized at a higher level, I believe. And it's been my belief for a long time now that we're not getting value for money that's being poured in at the top in terms of how our system is organized because it's not really a system. It is a bunch of disconnected pieces that are not organized in any fashion. Um, and I think that uh, reorganization and redesign is kind of at the center of turning it into a business um, and measuring the right things to be able to do that. And I think one of the ways of doing that is to benchmark ourselves against the rest of the world in our product, which we see in uh, a lot of the presentations here this morning. Now, um, in Canada, we choose to make this uh, rationing decision to make people line up for access to care. Um, this is an advertisement from 
one of the American news channels talking about, do you really want this kind of a system in the United States? And then people in Canada like to show these, this other picture of how expensive U.S. healthcare is to show that uh, it costs way more to give access to people. It's still not a value proposition. Are they getting value for money? There's just a lot more money providing access. So the real question is, besides pouring more money in, are there other options? Well, prevention of disease is one option. And that's really expensive and going to take a long time. Um, it's definitely the right thing to do. But uh, where's the money going to come from to do that? You just pour more money into prevention while treating? Well, I believe there's still huge waste in the existing system. And that I believe that we can uh, definitely do a lot more to optimize it. And I do believe it's possible. So I think a compromise is required between access, quality, and cost. And there are, is no better group to make that uh, decision than physicians. But you must measure all three things, access, quality, and cost, to drive the value proposition. Um, and you must engage physicians in balancing all three. If you treat them like employees, or try command and control them, it doesn't work. They need to be engaged as business managers of this big system. So I'm being provocative now. Um, so I believe that the key to sustainability of our health system is exactly that, is engaging doctors as co-managers with evidence, because they're very evidence-driven as, as a group, and they're making decisions that are driving 74 cents on the dollar, um, so who do you want on your side in getting cost under control and giving them tools to do that? I think it's physicians. And I believe there is a proposition here whereby we could reinvest money saved in making efficiency decisions, appropriate decisions, and safety decisions in driving access, acceptability, and effectiveness of our system. And I don't think it would be that difficult to do that. So. I'm a big advocate of evidence, uh, data to drive decisions, feed it back to the right people to make the decisions, set targets, benchmarks, measure people against whether they're achieving targets and benchmarks, incent them to hit those targets and benchmarks of efficient and effective care. And how about we stop doing things that don't work? And to do all that, you need new accountability mechanisms that uh, don't exist. So we need some policy changes. <coughs> you need to align incentives, which don't exist right now. You need to do that through measurement. You need to track performance, a measurement-based performance system of uh, tracking, incenting, Paying for performance, I believe, is the right thing to do, and incenting pay, uh, people to hit targets. Um, and I believe, fundamentally, this has to happen bottom up, not top down. So it has to happen out in the trenches, where, as uh, Mr. Balsilli said this morning, you engage, 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 develop relationships, bunch of little projects, do it bottom up. Uh, you, not the grand design top down, won't work, got to do it bottom up. Um, and I believe that uh, that's what we're trying to do in bone and joint world, is engage those providers bottom up with this thing called an institute that's just trying to do that. Engage, redesign, support with measurement, drive change bottom up. Uh, we've got some evidence that that works. Um, and I think we can do a heck of a lot more the models will transcend all areas of healthcare. Um, they're just business models applied to healthcare with uh, good information systems. So I would encourage all the students here to get into this area. It's a huge potential area for the future in this country. Healthcare should be an engine driving our economy, not draining it. Thank you.